In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Even though they rhyme, preaching and teaching aren't exactly the same thing. They do overlap a bit. It's kind of like squares and rectangles. And my little commentary this afternoon on our scriptures is probably going to lean maybe a little more towards the teaching side than the usual. The, the educational objectives, the uh, learning outcomes, I hope will be that you see how inextricably linked our mission, love, and the Eucharist. Mission, love, and the Eucharist. And what runs through all of them is sacrifice. Now, our readings today, all of them, have a strong ethical component, you know, right living, especially um, about obedience to God and reaching out and um, helping others, caring for others. The obedience of God, the care of others. And this is rooted in a history of divine rescue. Rescue from slavery. Rescue from desert places. Spiritual, psychological, and literal. Um, rescue from profit, uh, poverty. Rescues from uh, all that cripples and blinds us. But, you know, this, this absolutely kills me. And, and, you know, you, you look at this. When I look at my own life, let alone the history of the people of God, I, I, I don't get it, but I do it. You know, we have this all too human tendency to forget our own history of, of, of redemption, of being saved, to forget our responsibility. And so it is that the prophet Jeremiah in uh, today's first reading, says, Be appalled, O heavens. Be appalled, O heavens. Be appalled at this. Be shocked. Absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. Be utterly desolate. So you can see that our outreach, each of us, and as a congregation too, our outreach and our social responsibility, these are not minor concerns. These aren't just add-ons to religion. These are godly imperatives, and indeed, these are one of the ways God reveals himself. Now, the thing about this critique, I mean, this is a pattern I've noticed throughout Scripture. When you see God's critique of his people, of any people, when you see God's critique, his judgment, always embedded in there somewhere is also Paul. And so I think for us here at Incarnation Church, this is timely. This message is timely. I mean, we're so new. We just started our official launches in April. But we are at a place now, and we'll talk about this more at our parish meeting next Sunday. But we're at a place now where we're no, no longer looking at the sorts of issues that you have as you're launching a venture like this, but where we're now turning our attention towards, well, okay, now we're here. Why are we here? God so opened the doors to us in this place, here in the script district, against all of our planning and scheming and strategizing, He put us here. So there's a reason for it, and we're seeking to discern that so that we can be a neighborhood church as well as a destination church. So we do have people from Moon to O'Hara, from um, you know from Butler to Irwin. But uh, yeah, we're really looking a lot at our mission now. So I think this comes at a good time. The the, the challenge which God gives us it, it's just, it, it's at least implicit in all of our lessons today, but especially strong in Jeremiah, in the Psalm, and in the Epistle to the Hebrews. Um, and the thing is, we have so many ideas. Um, that's one nice thing about a creative congregation like this. You know, with all the brains we have and all the creativity we have, I don't think we're going to have to worry about, well, what can we do? What could we do? It's a matter of, you know, in a list of a thousand great ideas, what should we be doing 
now. What's the best thing to be doing now? But you know, today's readings contain within them not only a critique, but they also give us the framework for our good works. This is probably most overtly stated, most concisely stated, at the beginning of our epistle reading, the epistle, the anonymous epistle to the Hebrews. Let mutual love continue. Let mutual, and, and the mutuality has to do with love for one another in a congregational setting. It has to do with our love for others outside of this circle. The mutuality, of course, also has to do with our love for God and God's love for us. Let mutual love continue. And then twice Hebrews says, do not neglect to, this, that, and the other. Twice it says, remember this or that. There's this entire inventory of what we can call rules of the household. This is actually kind of a genre one finds in the New Testament epistles. It's usually towards the end of an epistle. It's not only here in the anonymous Hebrew epistle, but you find it in Paul and in Peter and others. Um, you know, the epistle to the Hebrews is one of the headiest books in the New Testament. Probably the most philosophical book in the New Testament. But here we are, right toward the very end of the letter, just before the author is signing off and saying goodbye. And he goes into something very practical. It is these rules of the house. Rules of the household. Rules of the household of God. Do not, well, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Do not neglect to do good and share what you have. Remember those who are in prison and who are being tortured. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. And I can tell you, we do appreciate your remembrance of us and your prayers for us. The inventory continues with just pithy little bits about family life, about fidelity, about the love of money. It's against it. About um, contentment. All of this under the rubric of let mutual love continue. And this is not flower power, VW boss, Woodstock love, okay? This is not free love. This is costly love. This is a love which is hard work, a love which never gives up, a love which can sometimes be messy because family is messy. A love which requires discipline, sometimes involves some trial and error, and always sacrifice. All of the sorts of things which Jesus demonstrated in his life and signified in his death. For Christ at the cross reconciles us to God. He also demonstrates his love for us ultimately, unconditionally. Now, and that's what's so profound about the Eucharist. Right? You think about some of these cognates we have here. Communion, right? Holy Communion. Communion. Um, communicate. Community or um, communal. Um, common, as in the common table or the common cup. The when we meet together in worship like this, and when we meet at the table, when we meet at the altar, we are drawn together in Christ, drawn together under the banner of His sacrifice, really. But we are drawn together in Christ before we're sent out to do His work. So, you know, St. Paul writing to the church of Corinth, he said, you know, when you share the same bread, you become one body. So this is a, an instrument of, of, of unity. The table is, the bread is, the wine. An, an instrument of unity. I mean, you know, we break bread together, right? And yet, the bread is broken. Um, we're broken. It, it, it's interesting that God calls us, Christ calls us 
into his body and into his work. Um, and, and he does it as we are, not as we think we ought to be, not as we wish we were, not uh, as we hope to be someday, but the way we are now. And it's broken. We really are. I mean, you know, as your pastor, I know most of you pretty well, and a lot of you very well. And you know, frankly, a lot of us are, no, no, most of us are pretty messed up. <laughs> if only you knew the half of it. <laughs> We are what every now and calls the wounded healers. But we have so much to give. We have so much to give. You know, love is always sacrificial. Love gives. I mean, by definition it does. Okay? It, it, it's, I'm not talking romance. I'm not talking sex. But love in its ultimate. The, the, the biblical agape love. Of love gives. It comes from your treasure. It comes from who you are and what you have. All that you are. Love can come from your well. It can come from your resources, from your money, from your uh, time, your talent, your experience, your health. This is not to say, you know, that, that's not to uh, justify you know, being intemperate. But you know, there, if you are gifted with good health, it may be indeed so you can be a blessing to others. It's a strength to do the work that God has given us to do. But you know, I mean, there are actually some times when in the work of God, uh, one does face considerable sacrifice, even of one's well-being. Um, would, you, would you look in the inner panel of your bulletins? There's a, a picture which quite moved me this week. But I'll, um, you see, it, it's right there in the, uh, the place for the offertory in our bulletin. Um, it's by Alphonse Le Gros, a French, a French artist and illustrator who eventually moved to England. But it, it, it's a 19th century representation of a medieval scene, kind of a romantic view, I guess, of the medieval period. But th this is when the plague uh, was devastating Europe. And the picture is of Rome, a street in Rome, and the cardinal, followed by a number of acolytes and other clergy, not all of whom look all that happy to be there with them, by the way, in this uh, act of caring and service and mission. Um, but he is there to give the communion, to give the bread of communion these victims of the plague who are just lined up, almost piled up in the streets of Rome. Now that's risky. But this is one of those situations where in the service of God and the service of humanity the risk of Catching the plague of nothing like the tragedy of these children of God not receiving communion. And so here is a cleric who is willing to sacrifice everything. You know, sometimes we even talk about, don't we, the ultimate sacrifice if we're talking about martyrdom, uh, the ultimate sacrifice. But giving is not always a loss. Our epistle does say to share what we have. Doesn't say anything about sharing what we don't have. But uh, you know, more seriously, um, you know, it, it, well, it talks about a sacrifice which is continual, right? No loss there. It's you know, you give, but you're giving from something which is constantly replenished, right? What is this sacrifice that the anonymous author of the Epistle to the Hebrews is talking about? The sacrifice which is continual. What is it? It is worship. Through Christ, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that confess His name. So giving ourselves is not lost. 
We give our all to God and we share what we have with others. We give our all to God. We share what we have with others from what God has given us in the first place. So if He wants us to have more and to give more, He'll do it. It's the ultimate re-gifting, right? Ah. You know, food is so full of memories. I remember the first time I ate a meal in which I was actually moved in the same way that I've been moved by, you know, a symphony by Brahms. I didn't even know that was possible. But I was producing some recordings in France, uh, I don't know, 10 or more years ago now. But I was in France and I'm doing, doing some broadcasts. And I was staying in the city of Tours. It's uh, right at the heart of the Loire Valley, which is sort of the bread basket for a country which knows its food anyway, right? And I had promised myself that this time in France I was not going to get out without going to a restaurant, at least once. You know, getting to a restaurant um, which had Michelin stars, which had one or two or three stars in the Michelin ratings, the Michelin guide. And so I did. I had a night off, and I uh, found a Michelin starred restaurant that was on the outskirts of the tour. So I went, sat out on the patio. There was, I had two servers, right? A waiter and a sommelier. I'm waiting on my hand and throat. I could get used to that. So I, I, I got my order in. But before my first ordered dish came out, they came out with just a little plate of of um, amuse-bouche, just, just little things to play with your palate, you know. And I, I, they were beautifully presented. I couldn't even tell what all they were, and I really didn't care. They were so pretty. So I put the first one in my mouth, which is bite-sized things, four of them, each different, each just, just a little world unto itself. And I take the bite, the first one, and I kid you not, I don't think I'm all that sentimental a person. Once in a while I get a little teary-eyed and maybe in a good movie. But uh, so I take this bite full and I had tears come to my eyes from food. You know, I mean, it, was, it, it was like when the trombones come in just before the big theme in the finale of the Symphony Number no. One by Brahms. You know, it's the same sort of feeling. And it was food. It was the first time I realized that cuisine was one of the major art forms, along with music, poetry, and drama. <laughs> and I wasn't even expecting it. You know, it was just I take a bite of food, and suddenly I'm getting teary eyed. Now I had a whole meal to think about this, and so I did. I gave it some serious thought, and I finally figured out. No, no, no. This, it, it's very easy to explain why I was being so moved by it. Uh, the chef was playing with my memory. I don't know what it is for you. Some of you will probably have hot dogs tomorrow, and you've been having hot dogs for decades on Labor Day. Um, for some of you, it might be macaroni and cheese or some dish that your grandmother made. But here I was, and it was bringing back all of these threads of memory from so much of my life. And I think it was also reminding me of the distance between me and all the people I loved back in the States. And so it elicited all that memory. Um, you know, the table the altar from which we are spiritually refreshed every week. The altar, the table, from which we are spiritually refreshed every week. I've got three bullet points here. Um, remind us, remind us of Christ's sacrifice for us. The table, the altar, feeds us with what we need, what we need now, what you need and what we collectively as Incarnation Church need too for this phase in our mission and our reaching out. And this comes back to where we started. It incorporates us into Christ's work in the world. The table the altar from which we are refreshed each week reminds us of Christ's sacrifice 
for us. This is a reminder. It's not just don't forget, but it's, it's, it's very participatory. It reminds us of Christ's sacrifice for us. It feeds us with what we need now. And it incorporates us into Christ's saving, grace, hospitable, healing, sacrificial work for the world. Let's pray. Father God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we are called to obey you and to reach out to others in your name. So fill us at your table with remembrance of your loving sacrifice that we, aided by your Holy Spirit, may be emboldened to do good and share what we have through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.